and welcome everyone particularly those who are new to i4is um, thanks very much for coming along and joining tonight i hope you'll find it interesting uh, very happy to take questions throughout or at the end whichever people feel more comfortable with um, so uh, i've called the, the talk boldly going where no one has gone before interstellar starships in science fiction uh, hopefully a few people will get what the um, reference the first part of that title is too but you'll find that in a minute if not um, right. Okay, so I'll start uh, with a few words about um, I4IS, uh, the organisation that, uh, that is hosting this talk. So Initiative for Interstellar Studies was set up in 2012. Uh, we're a UK-based not-for-profit. Um, we've got a US offshoot and got an international membership. We're basically, as the name suggests, uh, interested in interstellar um, travel, um, got a long-term ambition to enable both robotic and human exploration and colonisation of nearby stars. And how we do this is mainly through a programme of technical research and a lot of educational activities which range from schools all the way up through to postgraduates uh, in universities. We publish a free quarterly magazine called Principium and the most recent issue of that came out only two days ago uh, please subscribe. Um, you just need to go on our website www.i4s.org and you'll find links to print them and you can subscribe for free. And we've also got a membership scheme um, which uh, we set up a couple of years ago. Um, we are using that to gain more um, active uh, interest from uh, colleagues, uh, to get some money in to help us run our programmes um, and to get uh, a groundswell of people who are interested in these issues. So if you're interested in being part of what we're doing, um, please go on to the uh, website, have a look at the membership scheme. And if you're interested, do join up and help us to, uh, to expand what we're doing. A little bit about me very briefly. Um, so I was born in 1969, so I'm an Apollo child. Um, I was five months old when Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, so I'm afraid, unfortunately, I don't remember it. Uh, but I do remember seeing um, news rounds talking about Skylab crashing into the Australian desert in, I think it was 1979 when I was 10. Um, so that was one of the early things that got me interested in space. Uh, several others. Star Trek was a big one. Uh, Patrick Moore and the Sky at Night. Uh, the space shuttle going up in 1981 for the first time. And that reference uh, to Sean is because my brother Sean, my older brother Sean, who may be on the call tonight, um, and if he is, hi Sean, um, uh, he was very into Star Trek uh, when he was young and then very into science fiction novels uh, as a teenager. And I picked both of those up from him later on. So I have to thank uh, Sean for uh, getting my interest started um, in science fiction, both in terms of TV and film and in terms of books. Um, that interest um, moved me on to doing a um, degree in maths and physics. Uh, I later did a master's in environmental management, uh, worked for an environmental charity and um, as Rob's already said I'm on the I4S board and helped to edit the magazine. Uh, but I also read and write science fiction, hence the um, crossover of this talk. Anyway, enough about me. Uh, quick outline of the talk little bit of an introduction about what can we learn about crewed interstellar starships from science fiction uh, and then I've got five examples I want to go through briefly. Um, I was going to go for six, I had that in the, uh, the blurb about the talk but ran out of time to do the sixth one so I'm afraid you only get five and um, hopefully that'll be enough to keep us busy. So what can we learn from science fiction? Many of us who focused on interstellar studies got our, our initial interest from science fiction, from books, TV shows, films, etc. But the obvious point about them is they often make interstellar travel look rather easy. Um, yet, while the unmanned Voyager probes have got to interstellar space just over the last few years, uh, crewed space travel missions have spent the last half century since Apollo 17 in 1972 going around low, low Earth orbit. So starting point, why aren't we doing interplanetary travel at the very least? Why haven't we gone back to the moon? Why haven't we gone to Mars? Uh, why aren't we further out into the solar system? But then the big question for this talk is how much harder is it to go interstellar? So instead of just talking about traveling between the planets of our own solar system, uh, we're now talking about going to the nearest stars. 
And uh, as I'll go on to in a minute, the nearest star to us, Alpha Centauri, is 4.3 light years away, which turns out to be a very long distance. Um, so what can we learn about this from science fiction books, TVs and films? Now, uh, before I go into any of the detail, I just wanted to put some caveats up. Um, it needs to recognise that science fiction isn't intended to be science fact and that science fiction writers ultimately are about writing entertaining stories. Um, so though authors who write so-called hard science fiction try to get science right and might even use it as a central plot element, um, ultimately it's the story that comes first and those who don't write hard SF may be a lot more, uh, sorry, a lot less rigorous with, um, with the science and the engineering. So what I go on to talk about, it's not a criticism of science fiction, it's more just an attempt to use it to illustrate some of the concepts that we play about with when we're talking about inter interstellar studies. So what's the main problem? And in particular, what's the main problem in relation to interstellar rather than interplanetary travel? Ultimately, it's time. And in particular, the fact that if we want a project to get off the ground, and in particular, if we want someone to fund it, then it realistically, on the whole, is going to need to take place within a human lifetime, about 100 years or less. Um, if we look at the history of um, manned exploits across the world, there's very few that have uh, taken place over longer than a human lifetime. Um, most of those cathedrals, for example, have a, a wider religious purpose and um, where a, uh, a dynasty, um, a powerful dynasty, uh, has taken charge of a country, then perhaps the dynasty will be prepared to run building projects that run across hundreds of years. Um, but in general, most of the time, if you want someone to fund something, you need them, they need to see the payoff within their lifetime. So as a starting point, we're probably going to need our starship to get us where we're going within about a century, um, other than as I'll go on to uh, generation ships such as the one shown in the film Passengers, which I'll talk about later on. Unfortunately, as those who did um, uh, O-level or GCSE physics will remember, time is equal to distance divided by speed. So if you want the time to be less than a century and the distance, as I'm about to show, is very far, very long, then the speed is going to need to be extremely high. So this is the key point. Interstellar distances are vast. This picture uses a logarithmic scale of distance. So if you look um, from left to right on the, um, the line running along the middle of the screen, the first tick from the sun to the earth is one unit. That's one astronomical unit, which is the amount of uh, distance from the, the average distance from the sun to the earth. That's about uh, 93 million miles or 150 million kilometers. And then the next equal distance from left to right goes from 1 to 10, then after that 10 to 100, 100 to 1,000, 1,000 to 10,000 and so on. So each tick along from left to right on this graph uh, is showing you uh, an increase in uh, distance, a factor of 10. So we go from Sun to the Earth in 1 AU, uh, by the time we get to 10 AUs we're at about Saturn, by 100 AUs we're at the edge of uh, the solar system, the so-called heliopause, um, uh, the, from 100 to 1,000 we're then going out into something akin to interstellar space. Uh, by the time we get to 10,000 AUs, we're in the middle of the Oort cloud, which is a cloud of long period comets surrounding the solar system. Um, and then if you go nearly to the right of the screen, at about 270,000 AUs, astronomical units, we get to the nearest star. So just to be clear about that, uh, there's lots and lots and lots and lots of stars in our galaxy. The very nearest one to us is 270,000 astronomical units away from us. Um, so when we're thinking uh, typically at the moment about the difficulties in getting uh, a crewed mission from Earth to Mars, which is about half an AU, um, then 270,000 AUs might suddenly seem to be really quite a long distance. This slide really just says the same thing. So we've got um, Jupiter at five AU, Saturn at 10, edge of the solar system, uh, Pluto 40 AUs in terms of planetary part of the solar system. And then uh, Alpha Centauri 4.3 light years away. So that's 270,000 AUs or about three and a half thousand times the diameter of our solar system. 
So if we scale that down, suppose we had a scale model of the solar system that was one meter wide um, in diameter, then Alpha Centauri would be three and a half kilometers away. And to give a comparator, the furthest object that we've managed to launch from the Earth is Voyager 1. Uh, that would be about two meters away from us now compared to three and a half kilometers away to get to the nearest star. So um, inter interstellar distances really are quite large. And because time equals distance over speed, we've got a real problem. Um, now just as a, a, a slight aside, um, uh, a lot of the time we focus in on Alpha Centauri because it's the nearest star, but it's certainly not the only target we might want to think about. Since 1995, over 4,000 exoplanets, that's planets orbiting around other stars, have been discovered. Many of them are very far away, uh, many of them also very exotic. So um, there's planets, for example, made entirely of diamonds or entirely uh, volcanic in nature. Uh, and these have tested um, the theories of planet formation that we've come up with on the basis of our one single case study so far, which was our own, uh, our own solar system and the planets within it. Um, but as we find more exoplanets, uh, we're finding all sorts of oddities that are making it quite difficult to fit them into our existing theories. Some could be habitable, so they might be suitable for us to go and land on and colonise. Um, equally, some might be already be inhabited by any form of life, possibly intelligent, possibly not. One of them is Proxima Centauri b. Uh, this is a potentially habitable exoplanet in the Alpha Centauri system. Notably, I should say, Alpha Centauri is a triple star system. So there's two stars orbiting each other uh, that are called Alpha Centauri, and then there's Proxima Centauri, which is nearby uh, and gravitationally linked to them, but a, a different star. There's a planet um, orbiting Proxima Centauri that may be habitable. Um, and that was uh, discovered in 2016, so very recently. If we wanted to go there and see if it actually is habitable, how quickly could we get there? As I already mentioned, um, the fundamental problem here is that we need to be going fast. So going back to our friend Voyager 1, that was launched in 1977, uh, currently traveling at about 17 kilometers every single second. And it's now about 140 times as far away from us as we are away from the sun. So 148 AUs. If that was traveling in the direction of Alpha Centauri, and for the voice of doubt it isn't, it would take about 74,000 years to get there. So if we want to send a probe in a reasonable time frame, so 100 years, not 74,000 years, we're gonna to need to be traveling, roughly speaking, a thousand times faster than Voyager 1 is traveling. So how on earth do we do that, given that Voyager 1 is the fastest thing we've launched from the Earth? So that's our first issue to think about, propulsion. How are we going to go really, really fast? And how do they do it in science fiction? And can we learn anything from that? And here we go. Our first example of a starship is um, the one probably best known to uh, people across the world, the USS Enterprise from Star Trek. Uh, this is the version of the en Enterprise that features in um, the fourth film, Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home, um, uh, which was a 1986 film uh, which was directed by our dear departed friend Leonard Nimoy, who played Mr. Spock in the original series. So, we've got this, the Enterprise, originally came onto our screens in 1966 in the TV series, and has been going ever since. How does the Enterprise get anywhere? It uses so-called warp drive, which is a hypothetical propulsion system that enables you to go faster than the speed of light. Now, this, as I'm going to go on to say, causes all sorts of problems, but um, it's very convenient in fictional terms because uh, given that the stars are very long distance away, you don't want to spend every episode spending the first 59 minutes of the episode getting somewhere and then having one minute to actually tell the story. So um, in broad terms, as with a lot of other interstellar SF, uh, you invent some kind of very rapid propulsion system and it enables you to get where you want to go at the beginning of the episode, not at the end of the episode. Now, in the original Star Trek series, um, the warp factor, as used when they said, oh, warp factor six, Mr. Sulu, um, is the cube root of the speed. So what I mean by that is warp factor two, you cube that number two and you get eight. So warp factor two is going at eight times the speed of light. Warp factor three is 27 times the speed of light and so on and so forth. 
um, in later series they change that scale for something different but um, probably with some caveats that uh, that contradicts Einstein's theory of special relativity because the key um, starting point for special relativity is that the speed of light which we abbreviate to C in physics is a hard limit um, so if you start off going below the speed of light you can accelerate towards it but you can never get to it or above it and I've put a chart up here uh, I'm not sure if you'll be able to read it but you don't really need to I've, I've picked out some key numbers um, so this is a chart of uh, speeds different warp factor speeds in Star Trek and what they mean in terms of um, speeds in kilometers per hour and most importantly how long it takes you to get different places so just to take an example um, if you look at uh, going at warp factor one it takes five years to go uh, warp factor one to go five light years by definition because uh, warp factor one is light speed it takes six months at warp factor two it takes nine days at warp factor five so um, this illustrates that uh, the warp speed idea does enable you to get decent distances interstellar distances in quite a short period of time um, which therefore makes it useful from the point of view of someone writing episodes however it is worth noting in passing that this still doesn't uh, completely open the entire universe to the uh, people living on the starship enterprise um, it's very good for getting across our own galaxy but if you think about going to our nearest galaxy apart from our own one the andromeda galaxy m31 that's two million light years away and according to this chart um, if you wanted to go to the andromeda galaxy at warp factor eight which was pretty much the maximum speed for the original um, uss enterprise in the, in the original tv series it would take you two thousand years so um it might help the the warp um the warp drive using star trek might help us to get across our own galaxy but it doesn't solve the problem of getting to other galaxies uh, you need something even faster if you want to do that so warp drive seems to be useful how on earth does it work well allegedly it's based on uh, the annihilation of matter and antimatter which is what essentially happens in uh, a hydrogen bomb um, uh, that is a real thing. You can um, take matter and antimatter and annihilate them. On the other hand, it's apparently regulated by dilithium crystals, which are referred to frequently by both um, Captain Kirk and Mr. Scott. Um, those aren't a real thing. Lithium is a real thing. You can stick two lithiums together and get dilithium, but they don't crystallize. Um, never mind. Even doing that, this wouldn't get you above the speed of light on its own. Um, how you do that? Uh, according to the Star Trek technical manuals is that this energy is used to power the warp core or uh, if you want the long version gravimetric field displacement manifold um, which sounds nice and that generates a warp bubble between the left and right engine the cells so the big long things at the back of the Enterprise this warp bubble envelops the Enterprise drops out of normal space-time and that enables you to go faster than the speed of light now Mr Scott notwithstanding that he's obviously on the enterprise and runs the warp drive uh, might possibly say uh, something about the laws of physics at this point um, because we're still stuck in uh, Einsteinian universe where going beyond the speed of light is quite difficult but is it possible is it completely impossible or is it possible well it's primarily at the end of the day it's primarily as I said earlier it's an invention to enable you to do interstellar storytelling so you can actually get to where you want to go and then get on the adventure uh, rather than spending the entire hour of your uh, program just getting there but some people have tried to come up with a theoretical warp drive and the most famous example is an acting physicist Miguel Alcubierre who while he was doing his PhD in Wales uh, in 1994 came up with a potential solution so this is this is quite um, impressive going because he was only in his sort of mid-20s at the time um, there's been lots of discussion of Alcu the Alcubierre drive, as it's called, uh, since then. It's certainly theoretically possible, but requires huge amounts of exotic matter to work. So it's a bit of a challenge. Nonetheless, it's still impressive that someone's managed to come up with uh, a um, theoretical way of using laws of physics that might actually uh, enable a warp drive. So it's not completely ruled out. What else might we use 
uh, to do what the USS Enterprise does. Well, another potential way of getting from A to B very, very fast is if you can use a wormhole. So just to go to the next slide, here's a picture of a wormhole. So what we've got here, um, the uh, uh, rectangular um, array is space time. And what we're looking at is a wormhole between the blue bits uh, on the bottom sheet and the yellow bit on the top sheet. And the idea being that instead of having to go the long way round round the sheet, uh, you've got a wormhole that connects the blue and yellow parts and you go through that wormhole and clearly that's a, a, lot, lot, a lot shorter distance than going the long way round. So connects A and B through higher dimensional space, so the apparent distance is much shorter. Key thing here is that wormholes are consistent with uh, Einstein's general theory of relativity, so they are at least theoretically possible. The flip side is that um, a lot of people have been studying them and the likelihood is that any kind of natural wormhole would be very, very small, very, very unstable and almost certainly impossible for humans to use, both in terms of the dimensions of them and the length of time for which they're actually stable. So um, probably quite difficult to use, but uh, nonetheless, another potentially interesting idea that we might be able to um, use if we wanted to do something in terms of very, very fast travel from A to B. One other possibility, um, though again it has real challenges. According to Einstein's theory of special relativity, uh, we integrate space and time, which were separately thought of as, as separate things, into one thing called space-time. And there are two real-world consequences when you're traveling close to the speed of light that follow from the theory of special relativity. Uh, one is length contraction and the other one is time dilation. So when you're moving very close to the speed of light, um, to an external observer, the moving object seems to get shorter and shorter and shorter, uh, essentially disappearing into a dot. And at the same time, the time seems to slow down on board the moving uh, vehicle. So if you get to 99.9% .9 of the speed of light, um, to give you an example, because if you're going at normal speeds up to say 50% of the speed of light, these length contraction time dilation effects aren't really very noticeable. But at 99.9% .9 of the speed of light, uh, a one metre rule appears to be only four and a half centimetres long and each second on board the vehicle would appear to take 22.4 seconds uh, to the uh, external observer. So on this basis, a 224 year journey would seem to last 10 years and therefore a 2240 year journey would seem to last 100 years. So if your aim is to make sure that you get to your destination while you're still alive, um, then travelling very fast, uh, very close to the speed of light might be the way to do it uh, because the person on board the ship wouldn't age very quickly um, and so would potentially get there while they're still alive. Um, however, uh, you don't get to break the laws of uh, physics um, completely, so the external um, uh, time scale would still travel on as normal and in particular, as certainly has been picked up on in lots of science fiction um, stories, if you do this and then come back, uh, you might still be alive and still be, you know, a, a reasonable age, but everyone you ever knew uh, and several generations post them will all be dead. Now, having looked into uh, the USS Enterprise for a while, a couple of big things occur. The first one is, um, if I just very quickly go back all the way to the picture of the Enterprise, um, it's a very beautiful looking spacecraft. Um, but one thing that seems to be missing in there, because all the bits that you can see on there are fully, um, fully functioning and full of either crew members or machinery. So if we go forward again to where I was, uh, two vehicles here. The one in the foreground is a Saturn V that took the Apollo astronauts to the moon. And the one behind it is uh, the um, British Interplanetary Society's Project Daedalus. Uh, probe, uh, a theoretical design study from the 1970s uh, for a potential inter interstellar uh, spacecraft. Um, now the, the reason I've put both of these up is because if you look at the Saturn V, um, the about nine tenths of the height of it is uh, basically fuel tanks and it's the tiny bit at the, uh, the top that contains the um, three astronauts uh, and actually you know, lands them on the moon. 
similarly with the Daedalus craft behind, uh, the large balls uh, that you can see um, around the diameter of it are fuel tanks. The little ball that you can see between two of the large balls above it uh, is the fuel tanks for the second stage of it. And the actual payload is the cylindrical bit at the top. So what you see from both of these pictures is that real designs of real spacecraft uh, are basically almost entirely dominated by fuel. Uh, when you look back at the USS Enterprise, you can't see any fuel tanks. So one big problem is where's all the fuel? Uh, because without it, you're not going to get very far. A second issue for science fiction spacecraft is where did all the gravity go? Um, the picture here is from the International Space Station, and I picked it because it's got a couple of astronauts the right way up, and then one of them, who happens to be the British-born astronaut Michael Fole, is upside down uh, and running his daily exercises on a treadmill. Um, the point here being that on the ISS, uh, you're in a position of zero gravity or microgravity, um, and so you can uh, potentially be upside down or uh, the right way up or sideways, uh, and it doesn't make any difference. That doesn't tend to happen on science fiction spacecraft. Um, so my second uh, example is uh, the Rama spacecraft in um, the Rendezvous with Rama novel by Arthur C. Clarke, and this is an interior view of it. So Rendezvous with Rama, 70, 1973 novel by Arthur C. Clarke that revolves around a mysterious large object entering the solar system on a one-time orbit. Um, scientists send a ship to see what it is and what they find is a large alien vessel, a rotating cylindrical spaceship that's 50 kilometres long and 20 kilometres in diameter. The visiting astronauts manage to get inside, um, but the point that's relevant to uh, my dis discussion here is that exploration of this spacecraft is complicated by the varying levels of the gravity field uh, inside because the gravity inside that spacecraft is provided by the fact that the ship is rotating on its long axis. Um, this became, uh, a lot of people reread Rendezvous with Rama a couple of years ago because the picture I've got here is of the first ever interstellar visitor to be uh, discovered um, coming through the solar system, uh, so-called one eye Oumuamua. Uh, which uh, came through the solar system in 2017. It's a highly elongated asteroid, uh, displayed quite strange behaviour as it was going out the solar system again, seeming to speed up as it left the sun's vicinity, whereas it should have slowed down. It's probably, almost certainly, a natural object, um, but there have been some people suggest that perhaps it's a broken alien solar sail, and for those who don't know, I'll go on to what solar sail is in a minute. And there's an artist's impression, so that's not a photograph, it's an artist's impression, uh, courtesy of NASA. Um, the issues here about gravity on board uh, something, uh, on board a rotating vehicle, uh, are also picked up in Joe O'Neill's um, 1976 non-fiction book, The High Frontier, um, where he talks about building colonies in orbit around the Earth, which would house tens of thousands of people who'd live and work in space. And for those who've seen it, um, the 2013 film Elysium uh, about half of the action on that film is, is uh, based on just such a space colony. Um, now the point about this, uh, the, the point about the gravity reference, is um, that if you're on the ISS, the International Space Station orbiting the Earth, you don't feel any gravity or you only feel microgravity um, because the reason why that's true is because you and everyone else around you and the ISS itself are all falling towards the Earth at 1G you're all falling at the same um, gravitational acceleration as you rotate around the Earth in orbit. And so basically you don't feel any relative gravity or any relative acceleration compared to the other uh, people or the rest of the ISS. So you all basically stay still compared to each other. Um, that obviously isn't what happens on board science fiction spaceships. And the obvious reason for why that doesn't happen is because they have to be filmed on board the Earth, um, which does have gravity. Uh, so for example, the film Gravity, um, uh, starring George Clooney, um, that film had lots of zero G sequence in it because it was set in space, um, but it was also very difficult to film. Uh, an awful lot of it was done in green screen in studios and that costs a lot of money and takes a lot of time. So in most of the time when you're filming a science fiction series, you come up with some kind of invented reason for why 
uh, you don't have to worry about gravity, why you've got some kind of artificial gravity field on your spacecraft. Um, but that's not how actual spacecraft would work unless, for example, you either rotate them and then you can get uh, the equivalent of gravity through rotation, or if you do genuinely invent some kind of uh, wacky gravity drive, which no one's invented yet. Next example, um, Aurora. Uh, this is a, a novel, a science fiction novel, and here the issue I want to think about is entropy. So the novel Aurora, uh, 2016 novel by um, a very well-known science fiction author, Kim Stanley Robinson. Um, here, this is about uh, an interstellar world ship that goes on a trip to uh, a habitable planet orbiting Tau Ceti, which is a real star, 12 light years away. When we join the story at the beginning of the book, the ship's already been traveling for 160 years and there's 2,000 people on board. They're the seventh generation of people to be born on board this ship. The key focus of the story, um, at least for the first half of the book until they get to Tau Ceti, is um, about the breakdown of systems and how you avoid that. So breakdown of mechanical devices, breakdown of agricultural systems, breakdown of human health. And the question it's really asking is, can things be repaired forever? Um, I'll spoil it for you by telling you that the short answer in Kim Stanley Robinson's view is no. Uh, he's, he paints quite a negative portrait of um, what may happen and all the things that can go wrong. But it is an interesting case study in uh, the kind of difficulties, the practical difficulties that might, one might face. And Kim Stanley Robinson is well known for doing his research. So the kind of stuff he, he picks up in the book um, is at least pretty plausible. Um, it might not be exactly right, but it's pretty plausible. So a few issues I'll just pick out that come from that book uh, and from thinking about these issues more generally. First one is um, when you use stuff up here on Earth, what do we do? Well, we're, we're all familiar with chucking stuff in either the recycling bin or the residual waste bin at home. And if it gets chucked in a recycling bin, it goes off and is recycled into new products. If it's chucked in a residual waste bin, then it's either burnt in an incinerator or it's sent to a landfill site. The only problem with that is you can't do that when uh, you've got a ship that's going to travel for several hundred years to a dis destination that's uh, far off. Anything you haven't got on the ship at the beginning of the journey, you're not going to get on the ship by the end of the journey. So you need to keep everything in use for the whole journey. And that's pretty challenging. Um, you don't need to go through any of the detail of this um, slide. This is from a previous talk I gave on this uh, a while back. But the key point about this is if we were to just do what we do on Earth, where we recycle maybe half of our waste, it only takes 10 years and you've basically got virtually nothing left. Um, if, on the other hand, we manage to whack up our recycling rate to 99%, which is well above uh, current performance anywhere on Earth, uh, but if we were on a long duration journey that took 500 years, we'd be left with less than 1% of our resources left by the time we got there. So just recycling stuff really doesn't work. A second problem with uh, the idea of generation ships is um, certainly so far uh, we have not had much success in building closed ecologies. The most well-known example of this is the Biosphere 2 project that ran in the early 90s um, in Arizona. Uh, it ran for two years but it had a lot of technical problems um, and they tried a second version of it that lasted only six months and then it was basically abandoned. Um, now, that's not to say we can't do much better. Uh, this was the first large scale um, experiment at trying to live in a closed environment for a long period of time, and an awful lot was learned from doing it. But nonetheless, uh, there's a lot that we still need to learn if we're to be able to launch a spacecraft on a journey that's going to last, say, 100 years and not have everyone on board being dead by the time it gets there. And the third issue um, is just mechanical deterioration. Um, we'll be all familiar with that just from um, anyone who's lived in an old house, for example, or who's worked in an old building. Um, and if, for example, you go and visit uh, a National Trust property that's, say, 300 years old, you may well notice um, signs of wear all over the place. Uh, the picture here is of an experiment that was run on the space shuttle um, in the second half of the 1980s. Uh, LDEF was a long duration exposure facility, and it was basically had a whole load of stuff stuck on the outside of this um, hexagonal 
uh, um, uh, metal um, tube, uh, they were exposed to um, the atmosphere of low Earth orbit. And the idea was to just find out what happens to them. Um, and what they found out was that quite a lot of these materials had quite significant damage from being in orbit. Uh, but that's very useful in terms of working out how you can improve those materials and make them last longer. There'd be different challenges with a vehicle going uh, through interstellar um, distances rather than in low Earth orbit because the amount of material that it would encounter would be a lot lower um, because uh, there's a pretty effective vacuum out in interstellar space. But on the other hand, when you did encounter something, you'd encounter it at very high velocity. So it would have all sorts of impacts on the outer surface of the vehicle. Um, so again, you need to think about how, if, you, if you're running a vehicle for 100 years or 200 years or 1,000 years, how do you avoid everything falling apart during the journey? What's the answer? Well, in, in optimistic science fiction such as Star Trek, you invent gizmos to deal with this. So Star Trek had the replicator, sometimes called molecular synthesizer, which started off just as the thing that created food for people. Um, but later on was seen to create various larger items of kit. Um, our equivalent at the moment would be 3D printers, uh, but the only problem with 3D printer is it needs to have feedstock. And if, uh, as I was pointing out earlier, if you run out of feedstock because your recycling isn't 100% efficient, then your 3D printer becomes essentially useless. So long and short of this is entropy, which is, you know, uh, entropy is basically uh, a measure of disorder is a serious issue for a long duration space mission. Now you can overcome entropy through using lots of energy because ultimately that's what we do on the earth. It's solar energy that enables us to build complicated mechanisms, including the human body. Um, but nonetheless, you ultimately can't do that if you lose all your materials. Um, for those who want to know more about this particular issue, um, I wrote a paper on this uh, for the Journal of British Planetary Society, it was published in the January issue this year. Um, so if you want to know more, uh, have a look at that. The fourth and a slightly more upbeat version of a long duration vehicle, this is the Avalon from the film Passengers. 2016 film, uh, which hopefully some of you have seen. If you haven't, I urge you to go and see it, or, well, to get it out on DVD and see it, um, because it's, uh, it's a very good film uh, in terms of trying to do a, a pretty realistic for a Hollywood film uh, version of what S what um, what interstellar travel might be like. So, what happens in this film is it's a world ship heading to a distant exoplanet on a 120 year trip with 5,000 colonists aboard, and unfortunately, two of them wake up only 30 years into the trip uh, and can't get back to sleep from their hibernation pods. They can't wake up anyone else. They can't radio back to Earth because it'll take decades. Uh, so, what should they do about this? So I've highlighted this film because ultimately it tries to be accurate. It's not accurate in everything. Uh, it makes some mistakes. Uh, there are some things that are minor deviations from what would actually happen and some things that are more uh, major deviations. But it does try to do a reasonable job of looking at artificial gravity, hibernation pods, uh, self-repair systems on board a long duration spacecraft. So there are quite a few things that it tries to get right and does a reasonable job of. If you want to know more about passengers and the science behind it, um, John Davis, who's on the call, reviewed the film in issue 16 of Principium, which you can get off our website. That's a February 2017 issue. Um, and he covers a lot of this in, in some detail. So if you want to know more about what they got right and what they got wrong on passengers, have a look at John's um, review of it in the uh, issue 16 of Principium. Right, the final example is solar sails. Um, that's a real example of a solar sail um, and just to, I'll go back to it in a second, um, but the piece of science fiction that I'm talking about here is a short story written by Arthur C. Clarke uh, in 1964. So um, this is a, a relatively early science fiction, precedes Star Trek by two years. Originally the story is called Sun Jammer, later renamed The Wind from the Sun. What it's portraying is a, essentially a yacht race through the solar system. Um, so it's interplanetary rather than interstellar, but this is uh, interesting because it's using solar sails, which, as I'll go on to say, are a real thing and are of potentially real use for interstellar travel. Um, but these are huge uh, sails um, 
reflective and are powered by uh, the momentum of light bouncing off them. So the basic physics is sound, but the scale here is, is all wrong. Um, the forces that you get on a solar sail are absolutely tiny. So generally the payloads that are talked about are pretty small too, and certainly not human sized yet because the solar sail size you'd need um, to be able to carry a, a human around would be absolutely gigantic. But to go back for a second to the previous slide, um, this uh, is the Icaros solar sail that was launched by JAXA, the Japanese um, uh, Astronautical uh, Association, um, a few years ago. It's 14 metres um, on a side and basically it's got a whole load of solar cells to, for power. The sail itself is 0 0.0075 millimetres uh, thick, so it's very, 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 very thin. And it also uses liquid crystal displays um, such as you get in your watch, um, in your know, old style digital watch for attitude control. So um, just like the digital watch, uh, you get the numerals on it because uh, a piece of the LCD changes from uh, clear to black. Um, by using LCDs on this, you can change the color of the solar sail differentially and that gives you attitude control so you can steer the thing. Um, now, I4S have been doing some work on solar sails. So I've got a couple of pictures here about what we've been doing. This is one, the Andromeda probe um, is a project that we did a couple of years ago. Um, uh, so this is a, a project we did in 2016 for uh, Breakthrough Starshot, which is a large budget uh, organisation in the US that's looking into um, the details of how you might use a solar sail or a laser sail. So the same thing, a, a thin sail of reflective material, but this time uh, you fire a laser, a very powerful laser at it, rather than just using um, the light from the sun. Um, and uh, potentially you could use that kind of process to accelerate a very um, small uh, laser sail up to very high velocities. And in particular, Breakthrough Starshot are looking at trying to send small laser sails at 20% of the speed of light uh, to Alpha Centauri. If you do that, Alpha Centauri 4.3 light years away and you're going at one fifth the speed of light. So it would basically take you about 20 years to get there. So this could be a way, if, if we can solve the problems, this could be a way of actually reaching our nearest star um, well within the 100 year kind of limit that I've typically talked about. So this is potentially very, very promising. Uh, we've done the uh, Andromeda project we did in 2016 as a design project for Breakthrough Starshot. And this was looking at going at half that speed, 10% of light speed. So it'd take about roughly 50 years to arrive at Alpha Centauri. What you've got on this image uh, is a rectangular solar sail. Uh, at, its at its center, there's a chipset. So this is a sort of credit card sized chip um, uh, that's got all the, um, all the um, stuff on it to actually make the mission work. So it's a scientific probe built on a printed circuit board, about 12 centimeters by 10 centimeters, something like that. And then around it, you've got the solar sail. On board the chip, you've got a camera, a lens, a power systems, a computer, communication systems, everything else you need. So it's basically, it's a little tiny spacecraft all of its own. Um, and uh, I4S's chief model maker, Terry Regan, who's on the call, Terry uh, built uh, a couple of versions of what this might look like at, at, uh, at scale, at one-to-one -one scale, just an illustration of what these things might look like. Um, so that we could um, illustrate it and show it to people. And I know that um, people have used those when going out to give talks to schools, for example, to illustrate that these things are potentially real and potentially not that far off. Another example we've, uh, we've done another project. Um, this is I4S project Dragonfly, um, which was a different project, again, using solar sails. What we've got here, the picture is showing lots of solar sails in a regular array uh, flying in formation to encounter a distant object. The idea here is that if you've got to make relatively small solar sails um, uh, with really tiny chips on them, what you could do is uh, you're going to have to build a very large laser to fire them at decent speed towards, say, Alpha Centauri. Once you've built the laser once, you can use it thousands and thousands of times. So what you do is instead of having one spacecraft you send once to a distant object, you build thousands and thousands of these tiny uh, solar sails and then you fire them one after another at the same object. And then what you can do is use them all together 
uh, to um, gather data when you get there. And so though one of them might not be very powerful, using in a network of thousands of them all together could create a very powerful uh, mission. And again, we've done some work on this and uh, Breakthrough Starshot again in the US are doing work on this. Um, so that, that's pretty much it uh, from the detail of this. Some final thoughts. Um, Space-based science fiction has always been popular amongst, our re amongst readers and it's also become popular in TV and films over the years. Interstellar studies, on the other hand, are undergoing a bit of a renaissance at the moment. So uh, all these discoveries of 4,000 exoplanets have revived interest in what's out there. Uh, the interstellar visitor Oumuamua that turned up in 2017 uh, got a lot of interest. Uh, the fact that there's a lot of work going on on solar sails at the moment and laser sails that might actually create a viable way for us to get uh, to interstellar. It's very much unmanned, but nonetheless, uh, we can potentially send probes to our nearest stellar neighbours. Uh, makes it a very exciting time to be interested in this stuff. If you're interested in the science fiction side of things, then it can provide some really nice insights into the ideas uh, that we might want to explore. Um, but getting to know the science and technology and science and engineering as well can enhance your, uh, your interest in the fiction. Um, so both the, the science fiction can enhance the fact and the fact can enhance the fiction as well. So as I said at the beginning, if you want to find out more, um, probably the, the most uh, useful thing I can suggest is you subscribe to Principium because it's full of articles about this kind of stuff every quarter. Um, but also if you're interested, if you want to know, know more, please do join our membership scheme. And with that, uh, a few references there for interest. The Starflight Handbook written by our friend Greg Matloff uh, and a colleague Eugene Malove. Uh, excellent introductory text to um, how to build interstellar uh, spacecraft. And I4S published its own book on the subject, Beyond the Boundary, in 2016, which uh, has got lots of interesting chapters in it on these issues. And then some fictional stuff. Aurora, which I've mentioned, uh, is well worth reading. Um, Passengers, well worth watching. And finally, uh, a shout out to Colony, which is a 1978 um, book by Ben Bover, uh, who unfortunately, Ben died a couple of days ago of COVID. Um, a brilliant science fiction novelist of many decades standing uh, and Colony is uh, a book of his um, that is uh, set on board one of these colony ships orbiting the earth, uh, one of these rotating cylindrical ships that I mentioned earlier. Um, so just made a mention of that to say rest in peace to Ben Bover. And with that there's a picture of some solar sails um, which we, we've planned a mission to, uh, uh, to Oumuamua and this is a, an artist's impression of what it might look like if we had several solar sails or laser sails getting to Oumuamua and probing it. Um, and with that, thanks for listening. And uh, I'll hand back to the studio, as it were. Uh, okay. Got any questions? Uh, thank you, Patrick. Yeah, thank you very much. Very, very interesting. As, uh, I've got a few questions to ask myself, but I'll, I'll open it to the floor. And... Um, you can either unmute yourself if you want to and talk to Patrick directly, or if you want to put it in the uh, chat, I will try to monitor the chat and pass the messages on to Patrick. Don't forget, I'll still be recording so we can capture, capture all of the, uh, the talk and questions and things. But um, otherwise, feel free to ask questions directly to Patrick. Over to, uh, over to the floor. And while, while we're waiting, um, Bob's asked a question in the chat and uh, just let you know, Bob, my email address, um, I4S email address is uh, patrick.marn at i4s.org. So second half, i4s.org, is just patrick.marn, uh, the first half. So, uh, uh, which is M-A-H-O-A, as, yeah, as, as on, the, as on the, the little picture of me on the screen. Um, so, do yeah, please, please do, please do. Do you mind if I ask a question? No, please do. I am actually a member of the I I4IS, and um, uh, I'm a good friend of somebody called Peter Milne that you might know. Because mm -hmm. I... I, I've known Peter since 1975 when we first worked together, and uh, the, the interest in the um, in the solar cell uh, really was uh, about the fact that in Liverpool they're working on developing solar sails. Mm. They're working with um, Oxford Space Systems that you might might know yeah. the people who make the collapsible, uh, and I know the person who's working on, it, and she worked on Hayabusa too. Oh right, excellent. Uh, she's an Italian person who worked on Hayabusa too. She, 
you know, typical space uh, engineer, space scientist, Italian, went to Surrey University, worked at SSTL, went to went to Japan. So uh, I'm I'm in sort of regular contact with her. So I might uh, I might suggest she gets in contact with you, Patrick. Yeah, absolutely. That'd be great. That's all about the solar system. Their, their concept is rather than separate things to build it all within the the solar cell itself. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah, no, I, I saw an interesting talk about that not that long ago, is there people talking about how much can you integrate into the sale itself, and there's some really interesting uh, work being done on that. So, no, I'd love to love to talk to her. Thanks. Right. Um, should I pick up on the, the question in the chat from uh, Adrian? Um, yeah, what would be the cost of the laser envisioned by Breakthrough Starshot? Very good question, because I think the, uh, the short answer to that is astronomical. Um, we're, we're talking for a laser, the kind of laser power that uh, realistically you would need if you want to do uh, what Breakthrough Starshot are looking at, which is you know getting to twenty percent of the speed of light so that you get uh, you get to Alpha Centauri within twenty years, um, then you're talking about gigawatts of power. Uh, and so, first off, there are some real challenges in actually building a laser that powerful at all. Um, but secondly, not only have you got to build it at all, you've also got to launch it into orbit, um, and then it's got to be uh, held in a stable orbit where you can point it very accurately. Um, there's lots and lots of other technical issues around uh, the fact that a power laser that powerful, you've got to then build a, a laser sail that doesn't get melted by the, the very laser that's supposed to be pushing it. Um, but yeah, in terms of uh, cost, uh, you know, economic cost, it would almost certainly be very, very large. The one point that's made in counter to that when people are discussing laser sailing as a technology is that clearly uh, you only have to build the laser say the, the laser part of the system once and then it's of use uh, potentially millions of times um, as you you know you build lots and lots of, of laser sails and then just use that one big laser to, to push them out um, so it's very high cost but potentially of great use afterwards any other questions David. Hey, thanks, Pat. Uh, thanks, Rob. Patrick, that was really, really nice, very thorough. And I started saying, what have you missed? There, there's almost nothing, I thought. And then, well, maybe the uh, spore drive and mycelium network and things like that. Yeah. Uh, but then, then I started wondering, sometimes the science fiction history seems a little bit provincial. You know, I, I look and I see things uh, out of the, uh, the Soviet Union. And then I think of the, uh, the three-body problem. How, how different that was, and I wonder if there, if there are, are schemes, ideas that that you've come across that that maybe have popped up other places, and, and none of us have heard about. Anyway, very good presentation. Thanks. Um, no, it, it's very good point. I mean, as as a general point, I think there's there's a there's a big issue there about the fact that um, that we tend mostly to talk about. Um, uh, science fiction in English for obvious reasons and, and you know we certainly by doing so uh, miss out on a lot of science fiction uh, written in other languages and particularly increasingly Chinese uh, there's a huge science fiction market in China um, but also yes clearly uh, Russian historically has been huge amounts of science fiction written in Russian um, and uh, a lot of other countries with other languages uh, writing very interesting science fiction I haven't seen huge amounts of complete novelty in terms of, uh, you know, for example, propulsion approaches, but certainly lots of novelty in terms of the cultural aspects of uh, science fiction and the starting point of what what are you trying, what's the author trying to explore in the story that they write, um, and that sometimes does feed through into either the uh, the approach to uh, the travelling or the targets or the intention when you get to uh, the destination, which makes for some interesting uh, differences from typically sort of UK or American uh, science fiction. So I think it's, you know, it's a, a huge uh, benefit to trying to seek out uh, SF in translation. And there's some really good guys out there at the moment who are, are doing uh, stellar work at translating uh, material so that we can read it as well, um, particularly Chinese at the moment. Yeah, the the other the other thing was, I don't think you 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 covered mostly the uh, <laughs> the real physics based ideas, the real hardware based things that we could link into and understand. And 
as you say, Project uh, Starshot with the uh, gigawatt lasers is so interesting. Historically, the Russians have been just really good at these big projects. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know that they're doing much there. Do you have any idea? No, and, uh, and I think, I mean, I, I guess one of, you know, one of the fundamental challenges here ultimately is the issue of economics, um, because it's clear that, you know, uh, Breakthrough Starshot has really driven things forward because fundamentally someone's been prepared to put a large amount of their own money uh, into, the, into the ring. Um, and I guess one of the challenges for generally the Russian space program has been they've been focused ma mainly on uh, traditional space programs that have traditional customers who can pay traditional money. Uh, and so the more um, uh, forward looking, innovative stuff isn't really getting a look in because there's no one around to fund it. Um, now, you know, over time, that's clearly going to change. But I think at the moment, it's, they, they've still had significant economic challenges uh, to face in the Russian space program. So I think it's, it's just a matter of priorities. People have been focusing where the money is, as tends to be the case. When you were talking about um, translations, Patrick, that's, that's obviously a really good point that uh, David made as well. I wonder whether there's actually some sort of in, innovative ideas that are in stories that are, haven't become popular or even, you know, just because just yeah. there must be thousands and thousands of stories and books written that maybe just don't hit uh, hit the big time or the main readers lists and things and, and, and may get missed. I wonder if there's some hidden gems on shelves somewhere that that people don't know about I mean, i'm not oh, a regular yeah. science fiction yeah, reader there myself but uh, i wonder absolutely. and in particular i mean uh, you know at, at the sort of at the hard sf end of the spectrum um there's people that you know that you're you're familiar with uh, you know greg benford jim benford and others who are both physicists and engineers and also write science fiction and they come up with all sorts of really interesting uh, ideas um which they tend uh, to put in shorter stories um, which is great in the sense that you can you can absorb the concepts quite quickly rather than having to get through a whole novel uh, but the downside is that short stories do tend unless they unless they're lucky enough to get a lot of exposure they do tend to sort of end up on the shelf um, and uh, people forget about them so I think there's, yeah there's, there's there's plenty of really interesting ideas that have been explored by people and that really need to you know another airing from time to time yeah there's um there's Stephen Baxter, of course, does quite good uh, descriptions of all sorts of things if you if, um, if you follow his story. So, yeah, good point. There's a couple more questions that have come through. I have another one from Adrian and uh, another um, Well, can you read, can you see the chat? Yeah, yeah, I'll repeat yeah. if you can see it, yeah. Yeah, um, generation ships. I mean, there's been, there's been quite a few generation ship stories recently. Um, annoyingly, none of them come to mind immediately, but uh, I'll I'll have a think about that, and maybe we can um, I can put together some ideas, and uh, we can send it round to people on this call. Because um, certainly, yeah, I mean, there's 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 a lot of stuff out there on on generation ships. that have uh, explored all sorts of um, interesting aspects of this. Now, it's interesting. Stefan's added something. Russia plans outlandish interstellar missions, nuclear power, space. Oh, right, okay. Um, now. I guess the caveat on on the link that Stefan's provided is in the Daily Mail, so um, it's likely to be relatively lacking in scientific uh, accuracy. But um, nonetheless, um, yeah, I mean, there's there's lots of interesting stuff going on, and um, I guess they do. I mean, we've we've had uh, in in the page of Principium, uh, we've had some Russian colleagues who have written some interesting ideas, very far far looking, far forward looking ideas uh, about. Um, ways that you might want to uh, seed um, uh, other planets, sorry, yeah, exoplanets around other stars. Um, this is obviously assuming that they don't actually have life on them already, but ways of sending probes out that would be intended to uh, spread uh, uh, humanity to the stars um, via our DNA. So instead of us going as fully formed human beings, we might just send our DNA with the intention not that we grow us, not that I grow me at the destination, but simply that we send human DNA uh, to land on planets uh, with the idea that um, if it lands on a suitable planet that is habitable, uh, then you might get the evolution of, uh, of some kind of successor to humanity 
over a period of tens or thousands or millions of years. Um, so very, a very different scale of things and very forward looking. But um, yeah, we've had a few articles on that in Principium over the last two or three years that are worth looking up. Well, you talked about the propulsion uh, a fair bit, Patrick, as well. And, I, and if anyone's interested, of course, we will have a second series of talks in um, January and February. And Dan Fries is going to talk about Einsteinian physics and look at all the propulsion side of that. So anyone's interested in the sort of physics of that side and the theory behind that, you can pick that up, uh, up then. But do keep thinking of questions. The, um, good to see Stefan on, on. Well, I haven't seen you for a little while, Stefan, but uh, good to see you or at least see you online. Yeah. Hey Rob, yeah, nice to meet you all again. Okay. <laughs> Any questions for Patrick? I mean, uh, I, I had uh, a thought when you went through about um, the enterprise and where's the fuel and of course I remember the story about uh, 2001 a space odyssey because for the discovery spacecraft or it's interplanetary of course but um, Kubrick didn't want the radiators because you yeah. need with a nuclear power system you need huge radiators Absolutely. and if you put the huge radiators it was going to make the star the, the spacecraft discovery look like it was flying through space and it was very against that so he didn't put any on there and i don't think there's much in the way of fuel either in that uh, description yeah. but uh, yeah absolutely into no, and similarly yeah as stefan's just raised a very good point um <coughs> uh the the film interstellar itself um I was going to cover Interstellar, but um, uh, in the end, I didn't for a couple of reasons. One was practical, which is I ran out of time when I was writing the uh, presentation last night. Um, and the other one uh, was that the the challenge with Interstellar is it sort of mixes up lots of different things at once. So it's got some really interesting hard science, uh, hard engineering stuff about the spacecraft that are used. Uh, and there's some really interesting hard physics in there about what it'd be like to uh, fly near a black hole and all of that's been well uh, documented and uh, is based on uh, real physics but on the other hand of course uh, the um, principal conceit of, uh, of Interstellar is that right at the beginning of the film uh, he gets prompted, the, the, the main character gets prompted to do this stuff because something falls off um, his bookshelf and it turns out at the end of the film that it didn't fall off his bookshelf. It was pushed off his bookshelf by uh, his daughter or his granddaughter, if I remember correctly, who travelled in from the past um, by some kind of wacky time travel. Um, so it absolutely is a great movie. really enjoyed it. Um, but there's a real mix of credible physics and totally incredible made-up stuff uh, in it. Um, and I think I recall reading an interview with some of the people who worked on the film and the basic point was uh that the stuff that was not credible uh was added because it made uh it made the story work in a, in a sort of uh, a nice uh complete way that you got from the beginning of the film to the end of the film and the, t the stuff tied up uh but to make that happen um they couldn't work out a physically credible way of doing it so in the end um they came up with a rather more wacky way of doing it um and of course that comes back to the point I made near the beginning of the talk, which is we have to remember this ultimately is science fiction, uh, not science fact, and it's about entertainment ultimately. So uh, even those who want to try and make uh, a film or a book that is uh, as accurate as possible, there may be times when basically you just have to bend the physics uh, to fit the story. Um, and if you have to do that, that's what you have to do because you're trying to write a story, not write a, a thesis. One thing that's worth saying, Patrick, in respect of Interstellar is, the, is mentioning the involvement of Kip Thorne, who's, uh, yeah. uh, some of you may know, is a uh, Nobel Prize guy, uh, uh, retired um, Richard Feynman Professor of Physics at Caltech, um, who, who helped them with the, with, the, with the physics on that film. And he spent a lot of time talking to the guys at a firm called Double Negative, a special effects company in London, and, and um, um, he's, he's written an article that basically says um, the fact that I had to get these guys to make a, um, a visualization of these phenomena actually helped me to think about them not myself. Mm. So 
uh, some physics actually came out of the doing of the special effects on Interstellar, yeah. which was an interesting reversal of, of uh, yeah, absolutely. the absolutely situation. Yeah, I actually spoke briefly to to some of the guys from the double negative. They turned up at a, a thing we did at the BIS. I think uh, maybe one or two others others here had a chance to talk to them as well. I, I can't remember. It's a long time ago. So here's a here's a question for the audience. And how many how many science fiction authors do we have listening in at the moment? Uh, you can maybe <laughs> use the reaction panel down on the thing. But I guess there's a few people here that have joined in, maybe are interested in writing their own uh, material. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know if uh, if Patrick's trying to put his hand up. Yeah, yeah. I put my hand up. <laughs> so I don't know if they're planning it again, but the BIS have had their visionary project, visionary and visionary two, which was a whole yeah. bundle of short stories. Which I'm, you know, I had one published, but a lot of people who are not normally authors have had uh, have had some pub uh, um, stories published through the BIS that yeah. way. So that's an opportunity for people who are maybe uh, have a writing bent. Absolutely. And again, one of the, one of the things that um, I've I've you know written a few uh, interstellar themed stories, and, and in every one of the problems is precisely the, the issue that if you actually wanted to write a relatively near term credible interstellar story where the uh, journey is a key part of the story, then you've got the fundamental problem of okay, how am I going to explain what they do for the next five hundred years while they're getting there? You know. Um, <clears throat> And you know, the easy way of doing that, of course, is you just you know start the story when they arrive. But um, uh, it's th those challenges of trying to be accurate um, when the fundamental problem is that space is vast, interstellar distances are vast, and it takes an awful long time, even if you're going at a sizable proportion of speed of light, um, is I think one of the real challenges for writing this kind of stuff. Uh, and focusing in on the uh, the journey um, as opposed to the easy version which is don't bother focusing on the journey and just focus on what happens when you get there yeah, and, yeah a couple of good points from uh, Adrian there yeah Tau Zero um, by Paul Anderson brilliant brilliant uh, novel a um, uh, bit of a disaster novel in the sense that um, yeah they're in a uh, an interstellar spacecraft and basically the engine gets stuck on full uh, and so they just keep on accelerating faster and faster and faster towards the speed of light um, and uh, creates uh, an opportunity for them to see an awful lot of things because uh, as they get nearer and nearer the speed of light time dilation really does uh, come in so they basically live for uh, approaching an infinite amount of time um, but the obvious problem is if you're going at faster and faster and faster and got no way of slowing down um, you don't get to see an awful lot of the places that you're visiting um, as you just fly by them extremely quickly. What um, Do you remember what the propulsion system was then to be continually accelerating all the time? Was it a so ramjet or something? I think it was, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it was a bus or ramjet. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Stefan's put a quote in from... Uh, yes, a yes. Famous quote. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Um, one can always rely on Douglas Adams to uh, have said something <laughs> appropriate. Um. Okay, well, we, we're, unless any final questions, I don't like to go past about quarter past the hour just because, um, you know, I want, I want people to join in in future and not to feel like they're sitting through several hours of lecture. Yeah. That's a really good talk, Patrick. I much appreciate you stepping up yeah. to do that. And um, I actually learned something. I'll tell you about it later. So that's, uh, that's very useful. Um, it's, like I say, this one is the last of the series of six we've done. So I thank you and I thank everyone else who's given a talk. Um, and we're going to do another six, five, six or seven in late, starting late January. Um, through February if people are interested keep an eye on the website or I'll send out information on the distribution list I've got um, and I thank you all for attending or joining in and uh, it's great to see a few new faces Patrick did a very good PR a bit of promotion for the I4S and what we get up to and if you uh, like what we do feel free to join in um, and if there's particular topics you might like to see covered, maybe that's a, an option for you to uh, suggest a topic. We can we can put that to the members because we've got members involved in all sorts of areas of interstellar travel and, and education and technology. So we might be able to cover them. And um, 
Well, I'll just say season's greetings. This is the 1st of December and I hope you have a great festive series, safe uh, festive season and um, New Year and see you in, um, in late January. 26th of January, the next one to start. Um, any final questions?